we are recording. Um, but yeah, welcome. Thanks everybody for uh, coming to the May community chat. Um, it's uh, looking forward to Reclaim Open or looking ahead to Reclaim Open. So um, probably if you're here, you know this, so maybe I'll mention this just for the recording sake, but next month is the Reclaim Open conference. Um, we're all really excited at, at of course, at Reclaim because it's our first in-person conference since I think Domains 2019. If, is that right? Um, so it's been a bit. Um, there were things happening. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm really excited. It's going to be at UMW, which is also exciting. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to kind of just talk about sort of what we're looking forward to. We've had the schedule published for a little bit, although there there's still details we're filling in on the schedule in terms of like um, some of the panels and stuff like that. But the actual sessions we've got uh, locked in, you know, um, and, uh, and, um, and then we also are, um, kind of, uh, we've put some information out there on in July, a hybrid component to the conference too. We're, we're trying not to do everything all at once. So we're going to try to make July really focused on the online experience and June really focused on the in-person experience. Although we'll probably have some experimentation and other details to share around that too. But um, yeah, I wanted to talk about the schedule a little bit, um, uh, talk about what we're excited about, and then have time for folks to, um, you know, ask questions and whatever else around the conference. So um, yeah, I, I mean, um, looking, I guess I can pull up the, I should, I should pull up the schedule here too. Um, but if, if you're unfamiliar, you can go to reclaimopen.com and to look at the schedule, um, it's uh, right now got um, uh, the three days here. So the first day on June 5th is a unconference day. So of course there is a schedule here, but there is almost no detail because that's the whole point. Um, that will be determined in term uh, on the actual day as far as what topics happen and everything. But I did want to point out that um, we will have a live panel with some uh, uh, former um, folks from DTLT, which is cool, from UMW. Um, that is one actual already planned thing that's happening there. And um, there are, are, of course, our breakout sessions that are happening throughout the day. Um, the other two days of the conference, Tuesday and Wednesday, these are the main sort of uh, more conference-y days. Um, and... There's a lot going on, of course. Um, we've got a really packed day, um, pretty much both days, actually. Um, I'm really, really excited about all of our keynotes. Um, I will say um, I'm right now um, probably um, most excited about um, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick's keynote, um, just because I'm really interested to hear uh, more about the work um, happening there at uh uh, humanities commons um i think that's really interesting um and yeah i'm excited to hear more about that um and uh we've of course got a lot of sessions that day we have um a keynote from rajiv janjiani um uh, around the web that is um so that's gonna be really exciting too and then um on the wednesday is the last day of the conference and the keynote that day is from uh, brian alexander which uh, again i'm sure is going to be amazing and i'm very excited that we have three really exciting keynotes. Um, so with me kind of blitzing through the, the basics of what's going on that day, um, and I'll throw in the chat here as well, um, the link to the conference schedule if uh, folks are unaware. Um, but yeah, I wanted to kind of talk about and highlight what other people are excited about. And maybe Jim, do you want to lead with some sessions you're looking forward to? Yeah, I'm looking right forward to Lee's <laughs> session. I'm looking forward to Ben's session. I'm looking forward to Shannon's session. Everyone that's here. I love the idea that Lee said that the web of the future will be minimal. I think there's a lot to that, especially with the idea of sustainability. I think Tom Woodward is also doing something along those lines with questions of like, you know, what's your website's kind of like essentially carbon footprint and how can you minimize the impact? Um, Brian Olendike is always a kind of a show, if you will, the ed tech <laughs> joker. So um, I'm looking forward to him, um, you know, damning WordPress and 
you know, holding out the vision of the web components and what's there. So, you know, I'm to be clear with me, Reclaim Open, it's a 10 year anniversary for Reclaim Hosting. A lot of the people who will be there will be people who help build this company in one way or another, like through their support, through the work we did early at UMW and beyond. Like it's going back there. It's intentional. So I'm really very selfishly excited to go hang out. There's going to be a Tuesday night event at Reclaim Arcade, which I hope to be um, show everybody the greatness that Tim Owens built with that space. And so I'm really excited just to reconnect. I think for me, what I learned when I was in um, OER 23 in Scotland, which I went to just in April with Lauren, it was really nice to reconnect with folks and be in a space together talking about stuff and reinvigorating why we do this and what it's all about. So for me, I think that's the magic that's not even on the program that I hope to uh, capture. And I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I think, I mean, it's a lot's been said around like when being in person, the sort of the con the incidental things that happen, the conversations that happen, you know, part of the point of these community chats is to kind of bring some of that. But obviously it's very different than what can happen in an actual in-person experience and conference. So I'm, I'm really excited about that too. Um, I'm also really excited to see in this community chat some of the folks that will be presenting. And I um, am definitely going to try to put some people on the spot if they're willing to play play ball there. So um, I, uh, um, yeah, I'd love to hear um, a little bit more about some of the, um, some of the sessions you already brought up uh, Lee's and I, I wanted to see Lee if you wanted to talk a little bit or even just give a little a uh, little preview of what your session uh, will be about the the future is minimal. This this assumes that I have the talk ready. Um, <laughs> come on, man! I got a month. Like, let's, let's that's plenty of time. I mean, what you know? What are you by. hoping it's about? How about we could? I could it's rephrase about, yeah. it. Yeah, minimalist philosophy. Yes. So yeah, no, it's, um, I've been writing about this a lot, um, particularly post pandemic, um, and thinking about this concept that has originated in the digital humanities around minimal computing. And what, what they were really interested in is the environmental concerns, but also the sustainability concerns. Um, a lot of the times projects can't be sustained without a, a team of programmers. And so, you know, how do you ensure after a grant is done, or even how do you ensure that communities that don't have access to these kinds of things can do um, preservation exhibits, those kinds of things. Um, and so uh, Alex Gill, who's at Yale now, he was at Columbia. Um, he developed a couple of flat HTML um, uh, platforms. So basically a flat HTML version of Omeka, um, and a flat HTML version of um, using bootstraps and various other things of um, being able to create a, an annotated uh, digital edition um, with the idea, again, of making more accessible and sustainable, you know, it can all be hosted on GitHub, um, these, these large digital projects. Um, yes, Wax, that's exactly it. There's Wax and then I... I never remember the other one, but Wax was pretty much the one that took off a little bit more. Um, and so one of the thoughts exercises that I'm thinking of is that like, well, what, what if we took the concepts of minimal computing and there's four foundational questions about uh, what do we need? What do we have? What are we willing to give up? And then a fourth one that I'm not remembering off the top of my head right now, but <laughs> um but but again, in thinking through is like, those aren't the questions we ask typically in ed tech, right? In ed tech, we have the big ed tech narrative, right? Bigger, more bigger, more bloated, more data hungry, more bandwidth hungry, more, more invasion of privacy, more, more, more. Um, and, and it's become very much black box. Yes, a tech manifest destiny. Yes, exactly. Um, ben Williamson makes the argument that big ed tech has basically taken over uh, our imaginations, our ability to imagine differently about a future for ed tech. And so 
Um, so that's really what uh, the, the thing that interests me a lot about this, bringing, bringing minimal computing and ed tech together is being able to, to imagine differently. Right. If we took these four questions and we took these concepts and we applied it to thinking about ed tech, what would that give us? What would that look like? Um, and I'm really interested of what it would look like on an institutional level rather than kind of an individual level, because we have, you know, I've opted out of the LMS because I use WordPress as a course site instead of that. I have, you know, um, that's one example, but that's one individual doing one thing within their own purview and power. And that goes to like, what do we have? Maybe I don't have the skills. Maybe it's not a reclaim hosting skills school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so again, it's, it, it's, it's more of a, it, it is very much a speculative exercise, but I think it's an important one, um, that we need to undertake more often if we want to have really good counter narratives against big ed tech. Um, and I'm particularly, I like, I'm sort of heartened by the recent development by, um, the guy from Google who just quit and saying that this is all going to end up being open source. It has to be. Yeah. Um, that, 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 that is, that, that is a, a, a promising path forward. Because again, I think that there's, you know, people don't understand how canvas works, right? They don't understand that it's just a website with a bunch of paywalls and plugins. Right. I mean, that's essentially what a, what an LMS is, but they don't get that. Right. They don't understand um you know how these things work and i think that that's also something that's really dangerous because of the implications for privacy the implications for um you know making money off of the data um and also just implications for a pedagogy um so all of those kinds of things is like i kind of want to surface that and have that kind of fun thought exercise of what what the future could look like if we went minimal instead of the where we're heading right now, which is maximal at all times. It's interesting to me too that the literal title, right, the future is minimal um, to me because because based on what you're talking about, to me it almost seems a little bit existential too, or even mm -hmm. determined by the argument, which is just that like look like some things break over time unless you have people maintaining them, and by that very nature of that <laughs> what will be left is what is minimal in 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 certain spaces obviously right um and it's sort of well how can we you know preserve what we're doing um right with these tools that are um you know uh easier to maintain over time or more understandable and and for me like i've been really interested in like especially like the flat html stuff for I don't know, as long as I've been doing anything on the web, just because I find it so simple in in a kind of uh, a great way. But the problem is you trade often, you're trading that simplicity and the the technology in with this for complexity and using it so often, right? And, and I, I'm always looking for more tools that let you do this stuff that ends up minimal in a minimal way throughout, right? It's way easier to write yeah. a WordPress blog than to spin up Jekyll if you've never used it before, in my opinion yeah. anyway. Um, so yeah. uh, I, I'm always interested to see like, okay, what's the next version of something like Jekyll, something like Wax that's even simpler for folks to wrap their heads around and they end up with something that could be hosted anywhere, you know, um, on anything. And and, and that's and that's the thing about minimal computing. I see the conversation around Wax is that one person's minimal is another person's barrier. Right. Where, yes, it totally is easier to spin up um, a WordPress blog post. Right. Like um, it, Jekyll is hard, even with bootstraps. Um, Chris Schaffer, when he was at UMW, was working on a platform called Peasy, like is an easy peasy. Yeah. That was basically boxed everything together and it's still available. You could you could still get it. Um, he hasn't taken it down. It's available on GitHub. It's available on a site um where but again this is this is what's interesting to me in, in terms of the thought exercise is that if the institutions are going to support it right because that's why i want to move away from individual effort right we as individuals find wax hard right because if there's a there's a bunch of stuff that we're not 
used to in terms of programming, in terms of setup, in terms of all these kinds of things. Whereas we know how to click install on Installatron for Omeka, right? But what kind of support then do we need to institutionally build? Because right now we're, and, and I, I talk about this in another article that I can, I'll, I'll share in the chat. Um, you know, because if you expand the thought exercise out, right, right now we're spending millions of dollars on server space, on IT professionals, on education technologists to support Canvas, let's just say. Well, what would it take then? How much money would we save if we invested it differently in terms of people who could support something like Wax? Right? And that, that's probably not a good example because Wax isn't an LMS. It's a great, I, I, I'll tell you, you got me more excited about a conference that I'm already super excited for. So there you go. But there's a guy in Australia, his name's Tim Clapdoor, and him and um, I know Tim. Yeah, you know Tim. So like, yeah. he wrote this blog post, getting kind of to the heart of what you're talking about is how are we going to take some of what we've offloaded back on the campus and think of it in a way that's going to kind of move us to, towards a more efficient, more practical, right? More maybe localized, small or minimal being more beautiful. And part of that is kind of realizing that, you know the offloading that we're doing right now in the in the hopes of cost saving and efficiency is going to cost us significantly in the end. We saw that with Google pulling the bait and switch and saying, oh, yeah, all well, that storage we gave you for free. It's time to pay. Same with Microsoft. Yeah. It will happen. So I wonder if we're going to start seeing a pendulum shift back to universities, I hope, reinvesting in those people and reinvesting in that process of bringing these small focused apps and tools back on campus. There's obviously the challenge of paying them, but I'm super excited about what you're talking about because I think that future of minimal also links to a new future of hosting, serverless yeah. kind of more streamlined in terms of flat structures are super easy to host. So anyway, I'm excited about that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm, you know, it, it's again, it's this, it, it it everybody could kind of just say, well, that's it's not going to happen, right? Or there are all of these barriers, or 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 or. But I mean, we need to be we need to feed our imaginations um, to be able to have these ideas, to be able to move forward with them. Really, you know, because they'll just you're you're right. Like it's it's not going to be easy. But if we don't have them, then there's n literally nothing stopping big ed tech. And Shannon, it's interesting. I think it's easier now that I'm working at a big institution. Sometimes I think it's easier at small institutions. Um, be well, no, because like we are serving at a place like Georgetown so many different constituencies within the institution. And so it becomes like the LMS is the really easy answer for what business wants, for what the medical school wants, for what the college wants, for what school of foreign services wants, for what, for what everyone wants. Whereas it like PZ, something like PZ that Chris developed would have never happened at Georgetown. It really could have only happened at UMW where you have a smaller need and a very focused need, which is the digital liberal arts. Right. So I, I think there's there's a bit of a trade off there um, that in some ways it's easier. And yeah, in some ways it's harder because you don't have the resources. But at a bigger institution, we have more resources, but we also have more people telling you what those resources need to be spent on. Yeah, it's, sometimes um, it's not and, about resources as much as it is like supporting the vision of a small yeah. team or, or individual yeah. person. Right. Yeah. So anyway, it, that's, I'm really, I actually, now I'm excited about it again, because I'd like sort of forgotten or I'm, I'm in the middle of planning our big conference right now on our campus. So I'm like zoned in on that at the moment. And I'm like, I, uh, oh yeah, that, that's, I'm excited for this one too. It's a good point too. And I, Ben, I don't want, I like that. 
um, Taylor's putting people on the spot. So I'll throw you on the spot with the first streaming data API here soon, because I'm fascinated by that, especially with our own work with APIs. But the point transitioning, and this is, I hope those folks who come think about is, on Monday, we're going to kind of create an open forum for several hours where people can break out with a group of people and talk about this stuff. It's not structured, but I think hopefully it will give us a little bit about what we're going here, like just listening to you, Lee, and getting excited about where this is going. It's hard to just carve out that time to do it together. So um, that's the thing that I hope if folks can make it, and I know time is always an issue, Monday would be a space where we would do that. Um, and it would be free form. We would decide the schedule. People would vote for their with their feet, and then we go from there. So, good plug for the unconference, which happens on June fifth on Monday. Ben, over to you. API on top of all the hiking you're doing and deadlifting, hmm. you're also streaming API data. Yeah, you know if it's um, if it's all right. I mean, first of all, absolutely um, grateful and. Um, yeah, really, I, I feel a joy to have to come to this conference for the first time and to be back in person, uh, just to have that stimulation of um, spending time, quality time offline in these kinds of conversations. And already you're, you know, I, I don't even know what wax is, right? I mean, I just so this is going to be great. I mean, I know what candle wax is. I know what ear wax is. Um, I mean, I'm just saying, so that's what came up when I put in, I put wax LMS and it someplace was indicating where I could go get, you know, European waxing. I was thinking, whoa. So I, I don't know. This is all new to me. Google does not have me down yet with, you know, wax at LMS. It's throwing everything out there. All doors are open for business. But listening to uh, you, Lee, um, and I don't think we've met. I don't, you're at Georgetown. Is that correct? Okay. So a larger institution, definitely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, and I'm at Skidmore, so smaller private liberal arts college. And by all means, I think, you know, the needs of your institution, you are scaling your services to more, much larger groups with a lot more needs, maybe than based on our numbers um, in smaller environments. And, you know, I'd like to think that uh, in my small office, we are able to offer two sides of the ed tech coin, one being that we use Brightspace um, and we also, you know, have the domains and the community WordPress. And honestly, they both need each other to flourish. And so while on the one hand, I am the first to um, get excited when faculty come to me and say, you know, Ben, I'd, I'd like to get outside of the LMS, you know, like Walden Garden, the kind of environment. And, and then that gives me a chance to kind of off record to bash on them a little bit, you know, but I also, you know, privately have my thoughts about the, you know, the kind of insatiable hunger, capitalist greed behind a lot of these companies to profit off of the surplus that we create through our, you know, uh, web searches, uh, increasingly now, you know, the big elephant in the room, this, this AI thing, right. Um, you know, trying to make sense of that, but you know, if I didn't have big ed tech, it'd make it harder for me to also make the case for kind of the indie way of doing things, right. Or trying to spark creativity and curiosity in that way. So I'd be interested in, in, in also just talking about strategies to, you know, not altogether diss on big ed tech, but kind of recognize their place and value in, um, you know, having two sides to that coin, even though they do, uh, they do give me an upset stomach after a while, especially all the marketing crap. Anyway, um, so yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? Let me see if I can find my outline, Jim. Um, so I'm working with a really awesome student who just, he just graduated from Skidmore and he just got sucked up into a PhD program at Dartmouth. He did this kind of dual major thing where he did part of his undergrad here in Saratoga Springs. And then now he's over in, uh, where is it? Hanover or somewhere over there, Lebanon, somewhere over there on the other side of the Green Mountains. Um, and um, so, yeah, let me see here. I mean, I think, let me just talk a little bit about my part in the project. So, you know, I'm, I've always loved um, 
learning from really the extended um you know gosh now i don't want to say ed tech now i'm going to say the extended ed tech friends you know at reclaim in terms of guiding certainly giving me some development as far as what's on the horizon um you know not just as uh you know how do i do this you know hook up a c panel or a custom domain or all those things which i you know occasionally need some help with but just you know this this notion of the cloud thing right and understanding you know, really understanding, and again, I have very limited understanding here, so don't don't laugh at me because I'm still working on, um, I just literally created the outline um, yesterday and shared with Alex, who's the, the student who built this, this you know, who used built this API, right, around using the Reclaim Cloud. Um, you know, so the, just this idea of, of changing the hosting environment and, and working with Reclaim Cloud. Um, to build this site. And so, yeah, this student came to us and, you know, wanted to have really a, a, a lamp, Apache lamp web server, which we no longer provide, right? We don't do that in-house in IT. And he wanted to build a website and it was different from setting up his own, you know, cPanel and trying to run what he was doing outside of that environment. And so I approached Reclaim Cloud and you guys came up with this idea of you know, containerizing an environment where, um, you know, he could build this kind of big data hub of, you know, he's, he's in physics. He built this website where really I think of it as kind of this, uh, this massive super calculator where in class they can access, you know, large data sets and crunch numbers quickly to get some kind of interpretive direction that's meaningful in their class, in their studies, in their research. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's really, I, I wish I had more to say. I mean, I think from my perspective, wearing lots of different hats, I mean, I'm looking uh, to this example as a means to bring a new service online to my liberal arts community, right? So to have a, a place where they can find support and a place for these projects that, you know, aren't mainstreamed and they're still pretty new and exciting. And so if, if, you know, we can offer here in our IT department a new kind of cloud computing service that, you know, doesn't use, you know, Box or Office 365 or, you know, and build some community and synergies around that, then, then, then that's great. So, but yeah, to be continued on that. I, I hope Jim does. That's <laughs> I'm not sure. that's oh, man, are you kidding me? Okay. That's awesome. Just, just getting I, started. <laughs> and I love the plug of Reclaim Cloud. You know, I'm not beyond begging. You know that. Um, but... Shannon, we're coming to you now. I hope you're prepared. See, you and no one's gonna ever join a community chat again. No, They're yeah. gonna be like, Fine. what? You're putting me on the spot in the community, but I love that Taylor did it and I am gonna double down on it. Yeah, I'm actually working on the PowerPoint for the- uh, <laughs> Oh, cool, just <laughs> share your screen. Can we get a sneak yeah. peek? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want. Uh, yes, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. To okay. see behind the scenes. <laughs> How do I share my screen and done this in Jitsi? Uh, uh, third button. Third from the, the left. left. All right. I want to show. Wait, select window or screen. Screen. How do I know which one? Uh, this screen one? is everything. Oh, wow. So if you okay. have to look at another tab, then it'll we'll see that as well. A screen one. I have two screens. Okay, now screen two. All right, I can do this. I swear. You can. Allow. We believe in you. All right, oh, let's see. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's we just Cartland and I. So I'm working on this with um, Cartland Birch, who's the director of the Digital Knowledge Center. So so Jim, too, actually, this this presentation is kind of inspired by many of your past presentations where you you're like, OK, I want to talk about the work, but I don't want to be too serious about this. So what <laughs> ridiculous framework can we put upon it? So as we were thinking about the work we do in the DKC, we, the whole idea is that we, this is like a pyramid scheme out MLM we're trying to sell, like the approach we do with teaching students about digital uh, things. Awesome. So uh, it's gonna start like our approach is, uh, it's definitely not a pyramid scheme workshop. So let's see if I can kind of <laughs> job. So definitely not, and then there'll be a big cross. It's not bad, um, you know, it's actually a tried in approach. It's oh, you so know, it, it, you should, See, you are featured, so you know we talk about the. Jam. I'll talk about the jam. It's actually more like a band jam, um, but seriously, it's this. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of so we're 
we're, we're, it, we're, you know, it's rare that you get to use PowerPoint to actually intentionally create bad looking PowerPoints. So we're kind of <laughs> having a little fun with that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little outside of like, this. it's still kind of a wild card, but the work that we do is just like, how do you get students to actually engage in thinking about these things? And it's something I'm passionate about, like, okay, we can be practical and like, I can know how to make domain one's own work, but how do you actually get students to want to be there and get excited to do projects and expose them to different ways of just being technologically confident and empowered. So that's the, pyramid that's the work we do. Yeah. Just pyramid. brilliant. A well, brilliant yeah. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to, so we're trying to, we're going to have outfits and everything. We're going to try to sell people on our, you know, Love amazing. That, and that's the hard thing, right? Like the technology around domain of one's own is well, let's call it proven, right? Like it's existed for a long, it's trailing edge, right? But like getting folks to interact with it in a way that builds their confidence is the is the hard work, in my opinion. Um, and so, yeah, really excited to see that. Yeah, I mean, it's been like, we. it was weird. We had like this revelation. So like, you know, I didn't really talk about what's in there, but like workshops, like this was something a student came to, uh, one of our consultants came to us and like, they want to run workshops. So it's like the students are proposing the workshops. We help them figure out how to run a workshop. So it's not like we are doing this work. The students are proposing it and developing it. We are just doing the guiding of like how, what's an effective workshop, right? <laughs> you know, because that's the part they often don't know. They know a lot about what they're passionate about, um, but they might not know how to get there. So that's like where we as the full-time staff kind of step in. And then we also, we'll talk about this, the marketing machine that actually goes into how do you get people to show up to your stuff? So, um, Absolutely. been really successful. <laughs> the yeah. marketing machine, indeed. I would love to hear of your um, it to see if you've solved on campus communication. <laughs> well, we've actually been pretty successful. I'm, uh, yeah, it's, cool. it's 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 it basically put things everywhere. <laughs> that, it, but that's and this is that I you know I harp on this a lot in the Discord, but like the value of having students who work for you means like we figured out. The process and we go okay now you're in charge of like making sure this gets to all the places so that it doesn't become something that we have to occupy our time with um and then students feel empowered uh, so it's all part of the scheme <laughs> yeah. get the students to do the work for you <laughs> <laughs> i just think that's the brilliant frame i i love the scheme frame and playing it like you're at a sales meeting convincing people this is the way if you want to make a quick buck in it tech i love it This is the way, indeed. The A couple of other ones that are coming that I'm excited about, and they're not here, but the idea of surveillance um, that um, Amy Collier, Tom Warburton, and Brian Lamb will be talking about. There is, there may be, but I can't confirm or deny, a 90s living room that might pop up at some place um, in this It's like conference. a flash mob, but with furniture. <laughs> yeah. And there might even be an operational 90s computer, which will give you that experience, um, which uh, I'm super excited about. It's Plus, it's going to be really interesting. Many of us here, Shannon, myself, Lee, like we spent a lot of time at UMW and I've spent less time in that building than the both of you. But I'm very interesting to go back into that space and just be with a group of people because, you know, it's it's kind of like a going home for Reclaim, if you will, right? Like there is part of that. So I am super excited about it. My daughter is trying to convince me to take her just because she wants to freak everyone out because um, we haven't been there in like five, six years. And so she went from being a 10-year-old following me around on snow days to a 16-year-old. Um, who does not really resemble who she used to be. And I said, no, I'm not taking her to school for three days for this. But yeah, she's this is the only reason she's like, I don't want to go to UMW for school because everybody knows you there. But she says, I will do a campus tour to freak everyone out. Yeah. I was like, fair enough. <laughs> my kids kind of remember it as children, right? Because we yeah. moved, my oldest was 10 um, yeah. when we moved away. And so they're kind of like fascinated by it because it's part of their childhood. But me too, like to go back onto a campus that, you know, you spend a decade on and then return. It's interesting, you know, and plus it's great. Like OER 23, which is a conference I mentioned at the beginning, was one of the first conferences I've gone to recently that was back on a campus. 
And having it on the campus actually made a difference versus maybe in a hotel or in a conference room or it felt like there was something about that. So I, I imagine that might be one of the, you know, indirect benefits of going back to a campus. So I'm going to jump in here. I'm not presenting, but I'm here representing Annika, who will be presenting and will be there. Um, I wish I could be there, <laughs> but we're sending Annika and she's got two presentations. Um, one is on the tech bar and one is on our domains camp, which we launched um, this last winter. And so she's got a poster session on that. And um, we are hoping to recruit other colleges to also host a domains camp this August. So we, we kind of have this idea of um, our, in January, it was a pilot. And now we want to pull in a few others, hopefully to host them around the same time so we can do some partnering kinds of things as well. So she'll have a poster for that. And we were just talking about her packaging, kind of all of the materials and stuff that she put together for that and having little kits that people could take with um, s'mores included for that. So um, looking forward to that. And um, yeah, just a request to those that will be there to take Annika under your wing. I know that she's a little nervous traveling by herself um doing this kind of thing but Shannon it sounds like you you're at University of Mary Washington yeah I'd be glad to show anybody around <laughs> so oh, that's, I had okay. to literally walk downstairs I'm in the building that the conference will be in so it's very convenient just from what you're <laughs> describing it sounds like the two of you might have some similar roles and responsibilities in your work yeah. so yeah, take her under yeah. your wing if you don't mind. And <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be glad. Yeah, I actually, I ran into that site for the first time, the Domains Camp. I was like, oh, this is a brilliant idea. We should steal it. So I'm glad to hear that you want to partner because <laughs> we should partner. Awesome. That, yeah. <laughs> that would be so great. And I know Lee just jumped off, but um, mm -hmm. I definitely want Annika to connect with Lee as well because she had done um, another, uh, it was like a peer um, well, I forget what she called it, but she had spun up some other thing while she was, I think, at University of Mary Washington that I wanted. Anna yeah, to find the, out more the, about. the student beta testers kind of. That's thing. what it That's, is. Yeah. Yes. Are you still doing that? No, there was. It was one of those things that once Lee left, and then there was a lot of turnover, and that it just yeah. kind of went away, kind of went away, and was not something we could really sustain um so and then COVID would be, and then it was different yeah for a while. <laughs> well I know that Monday is kind of an unconference right or the first day of the conference is kind of an unconference thing no oh, that might be something interesting worth talking about again yeah the domains camp stuff um I'm excited to for folks to see that session well I'm excited to see, for them to see all the sessions and the tech bar one too but um you know, uh, Christy and I have talked a little bit about the domains camp stuff um, before, and we were involved with that at Reclaim, helping with some of the content. And um, the um, it would be really cool to see a kind of network of schools kind of run with that. Um, I think that would be awesome. Maybe maybe it's a future community chat topic too, like de depending on what you all want to do. Um, with it. And I also wanted to just tie in what Lee was talking about. The domains camp site itself is also just a bunch of static files, um, which is uh, not really the point, but like it is itself a minimal site. So that's kind of cool. I think one of the last things worth mentioning in this, in this kind of prelude preview, what have you is, um, we're actually this, we will have an entirely virtual event the following month in July, which will run throughout the month. It will feature recordings from the session with the approval of the people who gave them. So it will allow us to kind of revisit those talks, have dedicated, we're going to have a keynote speaker, 
Um, Olia Lialina, who's a net artist um, from Europe, who's amazing. Actually, originally from Russia, moved to Europe. I just love her work. Um, so she'll be doing one of the keynotes. I am also very interested in reaching out to um, Ian and having him keynote to talk about the work that what's happening with Proctorio and all of that stuff, which I really want to. And I actually, I'm going to reach out to him today. So he's not even hearing this yet. So if you, Ian, look for an email if you watch this, which you won't. But the point there is one of the things I think we're excited about and, you know, a few of us behind the scenes are working on is trying to use Discord for those of you who can't make it, Chrissy, or anyone else, to make everything streamed and truly hybrid as part of the class. We're not promising it as the event because it is purely an experiment, like most of the stuff we do. And we don't want to like say, this is going to be great. Sign up, do this mm -hmm. and not. But it is going to be integrated. And then that work is going to be kind of organized and pushed out more broadly in July. But we're going to try and create a fully hybrid event even on the down low as an experiment. So we'll be interested. That's something just for our own sake, we're interested in trying. Um, the other piece here that you'll see in the schedule is that there's these slots for documentary elements. And that's because we're going to try during this event to capture people talking online or face-to-face -face about some of the work they're doing and about the moment to create not only an in-the-moment documentary that we play at the end of the conference, but also to take that raw material and produce it later on to hopefully preview in July or beyond. So it's also we're trying to archive and capture um, the work happening there and the thought people are doing. And I'd be interested that's going to happen on the day of the unconference, the day of day one, and as much of day two as we can get before it goes live. But um, that's another piece. If you're wondering in the schedule, like, what's this documentary thing? Um, we're going to be, you know, asking people to participate and actually do interviews. And we try and capture pieces that we can use in the moment, but then later on, of course, with their approval. So that's happening, too. We have we're pretty ambitious, I, I imagine, with what we're doing now. So yeah. if you want to mark out time on your schedule to specifically come to one of those. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see what we can do with the with the the documentary. I think it's going to be really fun, um, and um, especially to hopefully capture some of the tone and energy, right? And and kind of encapsulate that and preserve it, or you know, share it with folks who couldn't be there in person. Um, and yeah, the hybrid stuff, like 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 Jim said, like we're. We're not announcing it broadly because we, we really don't want to disappoint anybody if we have, you know, network issues or something. Right. But um, but um, I think we've got a pretty good plan for that. And I think it's going to be a, a pretty good experience. I'm, I'm very excited about it. So, you know, Jim, uh, if I could just jump in here and you talk about the documentary, it just I had this flashback. Do you remember the NMC used to do the five minutes of fame? I do for that. I mean, it just yeah. I wonder if even the plant the seed in attendees minds to say, you know, or if just say, I mean, so I, for example, if I were to ever be interviewed by this, I'm going to be thinking about something I'd want to share kind of like that, you know, so not a lot of preparation. It's just that it's just the idea I had, you know, you, I like you that capture capture a session called the three minutes of fame or, or I don't know, but it, that that's just popped into my head. So, by the way, I just I found my NMC t-shirt from 2000, I think it was when they were in Princeton. So this was weird. I get to the point when I go through my wardrobe and my wife says, you got to throw some stuff out. And I still have my, my DS 106 t-shirt and I will bring that. Um, it may have a hole in it, but I also found this NMC from Princeton and it was a really sad moment because I thought, all right, now it's going to make its way into the do it yourself wardrobe. Um, but what a way to go out, right? But yeah, five minutes of fame. I, I think that was that was fun too. Absolutely. And I remember that NMC, I wasn't there, but I had heard about it. But I think Shannon also has the gong that yeah, Jerry, J right? 
Jerry, actually, yeah, Jerry, it's, Jerry remembered Five Minutes of Fame. We did a Five Minutes of Fame event yesterday for our faculty inspired by yeah, that, that. So it, it was so much fun. We actually borrowed a gong from the music department. It was awesome. <laughs> we got a giant gong. It was great. That is brilliant. The other thing I'm hoping for at this conference is, Eric, to finally see you and meet you in person. I don't know if you're coming. I don't know what your situation <laughs> is, but I'll be well, watching. Thank you for putting me on the spot. Uh, I'm going to have to disappoint you on that case, though, uh, sadly. But, um, yeah, everything that you're mentioning, uh, all the feels, uh, certainly for those old NMC get-togethers in the summers. Um, we actually had one come up this way to Rochester in 2016 before the big collapse and, you know, dis dispersal and going away. So, uh, yeah, I'm just a, you know, first-time caller, big fan. Uh, of Reclaim Ed Tech and all the crew and, uh, you know, general cheerleader, because uh, I don't actually manage uh, any anything uh, in the way of, the, uh, of a Reclaim property here. I'm more on the IT side of things, but uh, I do learn a heck of a lot uh, professional development wise uh, because I do instructional technology support uh, as an IT person. So, um, yeah, I'm going to miss out at the shindig um, in Fredericksburg, but we'll be probably there every step of the way in the July hybrid event. So I will be your, your, your taste tester or person who will take advantage of that um, for the follow on. I was going to say, we'd love to see you in July. <laughs> you might see me virtually. I'll I'll poke my head into any video camera or feed coming coming along. Uh, certainly during the event, but uh, in July you'll definitely you know see me uh, take advantage of everything that you do. Uh, and your, your participation your... has been amazing. Like throughout, I've said that several times, but like we really appreciate it. So thanks. I I am the cheerleader. You know, in general, ombudsman, whatever you want to call that. I, I am part of the person. I am the people that provide the quorum so the event can start. <laughs> so, Shannon, to your point, um, the timelines for show and tell, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Pilot answered it. Right. Well, yeah. Right now, the timeline's pretty flexible. I don't think we've set a hard and fast end date, but... Yeah, put something in. I, I, we're recording, so I'll say it out loud too. Uh, Shannon asked about the timeline for submitting for show and tell, uh, that she wants to make something but isn't sure if she'll get to it. We don't have a hard and fast timeline yet. Put in the proposal anyway. You can always email us later and say, actually, no, I'm not going to be able to do it. Yeah, the, the show and tell portion, the art displays and show and tell is kind of flexible right because it all happens at one time so we don't have to worry about like rearranging the schedule to fit you in so um i'd say get it in yeah cool any other things you feel like we should address or questions folks have i'm trying to think um but anyone thinking about what they want to talk about on the day zero the end oh yeah yeah, I'd be curious to see if anyone's thinking unconference stuff. I do. I I want to talk about, obviously, I always want to talk about the domains API with anyone who will listen, but also about some of the stuff Lee brought up with minimal computing and where is server infrastructure going. Um, I'm always willing to talk about the cloud and stuff like that. But I don't know. I mean, I love it. I was at an unconference in Vancouver. Northern Voice it was the first one I went to in 2007 called Moose Camp. And it was great because people just sat around and they, for like half an hour, 40 minutes, proposed topics. They put the yellow post-it notes and they kind of had times they put it in. And then people just decided throughout the day, that's where they would go and talk. And then people just hung out and talked. And it was very loose, right? It's, it's just about like having conversations and giving a topic to start. But it really, I found it really invigorating to just loosely be able to give an, an, a loose structure to meet people, talk to them about stuff. A lot of those conversations I had were over a coffee. So um, I really liked it. I hope it works. If it doesn't, that's another thing we experiment with and learn from. So uh, yeah, I, I have a bunch of topics. So I'll shut up. You guys can. 
Well, I have one to throw out there. I mean, I'm interested in this this AI thing, like AI literacy. You know, I'm interested in getting you know students to to like you know experiment and build and tinker with AI, right? Like kind of this assignments idea. You know, I'd love to have a workshop in here. I mean, we we have a third of our faculty who don't they think of AI and you know maybe they saw the Terminator in 1984 or whenever that came out, but. Um, you know, about a third have no idea what it is. About a third are terrified of it and ready to retire. And then the other third are excited about it, right? And so I, I don't know, that's just, I would be interested in knowing if people have thoughts on that, you know, beyond the big ed tech hype, I mean, realistically, you know, let's try to create stuff with it or at least understand certainly its limitations, right? And, but there might be a place for it. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I'm interested in that too. I'm really interested in like specifically the, how do we talk with students about it is kind of like my maybe biggest area of interest of like, how can we, you know, this is a reality, this is a technology that exists and is going to keep existing. And how do we help folks come to terms with what it is and how to use it responsible, responsibly and um, use it in a way that doesn't just cede all the control to the largest players in the space too, right? Like. It was brought up before, like the 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 like leaked Google memo, where they were kind of like, "We have no moat. The open source models are already here, and they're already better in some ways." And I'm kind of looking at that being like, "Cool." <laughs> so how do we how do we capitalize on that, and you know, make sure that it's you know, there's so many things to the AI conversation in terms of like what it the positives and negatives and, and who it empowers and who it doesn't. And, and so that's important, but how do we have those conversations in a meaningful way in educational settings is kind of what I'm interested in. How can we get faculty thinking about it critically and then students thinking about it critically beyond like the plagiarism conversation? I think not that that's not important to talk about, but I, I think that's very surface level right now and we have to go deeper with it. Yeah, I mean, certainly in terms of, you know, if it's going to help students build websites or if there are things you can create using images, you know, or audio and video. I mean, I mean, I, I know there's the creepy aspect of it, but I mean, realistically, I don't want to go to bed at night feeling depressed that, all right, you know, if you build websites and you're trying to help people build websites, I mean, that that skill and need may go away, just like we don't really have blacksmiths anymore. You know, I mean, that, you know, so. I guess what I'm trying to say is it, it would be it would be great to think about are there ways to not just, of course, ethically to use it, but to creatively use it and, and to really, you know, feel good about it and celebrate like, wow, this is me and my time, a 20 year old. And check this out. Like, I, you know, I generated this or I, I helped. I prompted the creation of this. And here's where it's great. And here's where it sucks. I mean, trying to tease that out. Well, and there's so many so many paths to go down there, right? Like you can. You can imagine, like, um, I'll just say, like, like the little bit I've played with ChatGPT, I can tell you, it knows a lot about PHP and WordPress. Like, what what about some future version of these things where you can describe the 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 design changes you want to make to a site, and it can help you with that? That could be really awesome. And how, what is that? What are the negatives of that technology? Like, what are the considerations to make? Um, how could we empower people with it? I think that's a potentially a positive thing to talk about, you know, like, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really interested. Um, there may or may not be an art piece around AI that may, may be of interest to some folks. So stay tuned. I don't want to give away anyone's thunder, but. Um, I'm, I'm also interested in, and we'll see, you know, if, if other folks want to talk about this, but, um, I've been doing just a ton of stuff around site archiving, lately especially but honestly since i was at snc like in, in like it's been something that always interesting to me of like how do we take these complex websites and make them simple um and and host them in a sustainable way and i think that's possibly really related to some of the other things we're talking about throughout the conference um and i don't know i don't know if i ha like i'm i'm curious to see what people's needs are in that space and what people's challenges are like um, so I've kind of put a, a script out there that helps use some of these tools, but it's, you know, the tools themselves are really imperfect in a lot of ways. And, um, I'm also, I'm curious to see what people are doing in that space.
Awesome. Yeah, that's a great topic. Definitely. That really yeah. is. You know, what do we archive? Guess, what don't we archive? Yeah. 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 My, the uh, the librarian that does the web archiving here is going to come to the unconference because she wants to she wants to talk about this because it's not only just technologically, it's like the ethics, like how do you, especially if you're a library, you're really thinking about like, do I have permission to do this, especially student work and it's a group project and all these kinds of the long term kind of implications of archiving um, and who owns what. So. Sure. Well, and, and even like the different contexts, like like Shannon, you and I have talked a little, a little bit about like like when when you say the word archive, it means very different things to different people. Yeah. Like to me, a person who works at Reclaim, I'm thinking about like, okay, how can we take this system and retire it and preserve the content in a different way? Whereas a librarian, like a or a digital archivist, is thinking way longer term than that in a lot of ways that kind of sometimes blow my mind where they're talking about like 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 bit rod and like the sun flipping bits and data and I'm like oh my god I don't know I'd like good luck with that I don't know <laughs> um but like that to me is fascinating but also sort of itself kind of shows why this is so complex is because we're trying to fit a lot of needs into one thing that at least I use the word archive to describe but like there's maybe more accurate or or uh, specific terms you could use, but um, it's a big question. It's interesting. We just had a conversation with someone at the University of Houston who's talking about data structures and doing a lot of, like, not leading with the app, but leading with structures and data. And I'm sure you do. Don't let me hold you up, Shannon. Big fan. You know that. But one of the things she said that I was fascinated by was, like, um, not only are they dealing with data structures, but if you're a librarian, one of the things they want to know is like, what's your digital plan? Like when you come for retirement, like what's your digital long-term management plan? Like, I want to know, like, it's almost like, what's your portfolio? Like, how are you going to retire? Like, how are you going to retire all these things you brought? And it's one of the things that like librarians really have to bring to the fore now about like what their approach is and what's their kind of, um, way of dealing with these large archives that they might create and then have to retire. It's fascinating that that's not even just part of the job market. Well, and think of how much we could learn from taking that approach and apply it to almost any project management, right? Like, like if you're going to spin up a service, in my opinion, you need to consider before you even start the end of it, right? Like, okay, if we're going to host this thing, do this thing, whatever, what happens when we're done with it? and we don't want to, and what form does that take? Not that you can answer every question ahead of time, right? But like, I think that's the responsible way to do it, um, is to consider what forms could this work take when we're done with this version of it, you know? Um, it's not an easy thing to think about, but I think it's an important thing to think about. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially like part of my group, the second part of it is, you know, learning experience design and digital scholarship support, right? I mean, there's that digital in there for a reason. I mean, most people don't go into projects saying, well, okay, well, here's, we, we estimate the half-life of this project is, and eventually it will need to be retired at this time. I mean, that's kind of a buzzkill, right? But how do you bring that into the conversation early on instead of like, we've got a couple sites where we're still paying like $100 a year for some awesome map me plugin, but honestly, might even be more than that. But I mean, at some point, it's a great site that was built. But, you know, who are we to come in and say, well, you're going to have to either pay the bill for this or, you know, we need to retire the site, you know, maybe it could live offline somewhere, right? We're not going to print it out. But digital still, I think in a lot of minds, maybe in mine, mine means online, and that means permanent. You could fax it on request, you know? <laughs> It's like how can we how can we earn some Bitcoin out of it, right? <laughs> you can transfer it to Call VHS. this number, ask for Ted, and he'll fax you a copy of all the pages you want. It's, it's that's the strategy. Or easy installments of. <laughs> now that's sustainable. <laughs> yeah, that's not going anywhere. So, um, cool. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording. This is a great conversation as always. So thanks everyone.